Hello, folks. Uh, thanks for tuning in again to the Britt Canawa Wes Hancock Athletics Podcast. Dan Crawl, April 17th, 2024. Uh, like I said, this is episode 106. And tonight I have Jordan Wyland on with me. Jordan is a one of the best standout individual athletes in uh, football and wrestling that we've had in, in the last decade or so. So I'm excited to dig in and, and talk some football and wrestling with Jordan. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing well, Dan. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great. I'm ready to rock and roll. It's back-to-back weeks of the podcast. Usually I space them out a little bit, but schedule gets back-to-back weeks, so it's kind of fun to get into a good rhythm here. So before we get chatting with Jordan, uh, like always, this podcast is not possible without all these sponsors that you see on my screen. Uh, I have 22, 23 sponsors tonight. A lot of good money going into the Sanger Legacy Fund. Uh, So thanks to all these sponsors. I have Nick Schmidt, Levi Don Trucking, the Brit Vet Clinic, Trollson Auto Parts, Window World of Mason City, the Brit Car Truck Bike and Tractor Night Cruise and Mojo Productions, Ewing Funeral Home and Monument Company, Miller and Sons Golf Cars, Doug and Kathy Zool, Daniel's Auto Collision in Charles City, Triple B's Food Trucks, Swenson's Hardware, Jeff and Becky Nielsen, the Brit Food Center, Kelly Real Estate, Carty Care Transportation LLC in Kanawa, Kanawa Community Home, Deemer Realty, Katie Salon and Tanning, KT Facilitation, owned by Carrie Tierhart, Gabby's Gluten-Free Goods, and Lifetime Nut Covers. Again, a lot of sponsors, a lot of good money going to the Legacy Fund. If you're unaware of the Sanger Legacy Fund, uh, we raise money for that fund, and we give it right back to the Wes Hancock Hall of Fame, scholarships for graduating seniors, uh, rings and plaques and footballs for state championship teams like we've had in football the last five years. Uh, we support any athletic or activity funds at West Hancock or any other community needs or outreach programs. So if you want to give to the pod, uh, give to the legacy fund, you can go to sangerstrong.com. If you want to sponsor the podcast, you can get a hold of me, Dan Crawl, and we'll uh, we'll talk through that and get you hooked up with that. Uh, way back when, I always highlight the episode from 50 episodes ago. And that was Dan Cooper, um, the guy who caught the game-winning touchdown pass in the 1993 semifinals to send Wes Hancock to the state championship game. Outstanding track athlete as well, and just a really good guy. So I'll have that linked on my post later on uh, Facebook. Make sure you check out the Dan Cooper episode from uh, probably a year and a half ago or so. So, all right, here we go, Jordan. Uh, I always like to start off with just introductions, tell people who you are. Uh, when you graduated, what you're doing today, where you're living, family, all that good stuff. Yeah, you bet. Uh, hello, I'm Jordan uh, Wyland, obviously there. Um, I am living in Osage, Iowa right now. I graduated Brit with Hancock 2017. Um, currently working for a transportation company uh, out of Parkersburg. Um, family-wise, I have a three-year-old son. His name's Oliver. Great kid. Uh, he's my best buddy. Um, and yeah. Just enjoying life over here, so. And siblings and and family, uh, people still in the Brit area. Where where are they at these days? Yeah, you bet. So my mom's still in Brit, um, with with uh, my stepdad Carrie, uh, brother, he's in Cresco, uh, been there for a while now. And then my sister and her daughter, um, and her boyfriend, they are in Four City. So. Nice. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That. It's- uh your mom's your stepdad your mom's who's that again carrie hudspeth so yeah i probably should shout out my uh stepsisters too kaylee uh kaylee's in minnesota everybody i graduated with kaylee um very good athlete uh sydney she's actually in um sorry there, there's somebody trying to facetime me uh mm-hmm. she was in uh she's in brit right now riley she's in ames and then darielle's in rudd so kind of all in the area still for the most yeah. part, except for Kaylee. So yep. driving distance and get together when you need to. So you betcha. You betcha. So uh, like I alluded to in the in- introduction, uh, you played uh, football, you wrestled for Wes Hancock. Uh, 2013 to 2016 is when you played for Coach Sanger and Coach Perkins. And I think you just, you have an interesting position is what I put in the notes of. You got to see an array of things as a you know, almost player in middle school, almost to high school, and then your high school career and how, where you finished. You saw a, interesting, some ebbs and flows of, of the program uh, that not too many people got to see because a lot of former players, it was playoffs, 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 maybe a seven and two record, missed the playoffs, deep run to the dome, 
but playoffs or a winning season was pretty much winning seasons was pretty much a part of their four years. Uh, your career started a little differently, and uh, a lot of people can probably guess that was that 2013 season. But uh, 2011 and 2012, when you were in middle school, they almost won a state title in 2011. Were two points away or you know, three points away from winning that state title. And then 2012, a very good senior-led team, uh, Chris Schlugger, Pat Smith, Seth Gopalo, those guys. I mean, they they were a dome-quality team as well. And then you come in as a freshman 2013, and if you're any kind of a Wes Hancock football fan, you know that 2013 season was that tough 0-9 year for Coach Sanger and Coach Perkins. Uh, you were a freshman. You jumped right in in a starting role. Talk about going uh, winless that first year. Yeah, uh, like you said, it was a very interesting um, set of four years for sure. I didn't really uh, – I don't know. I, I came in freshman year. I wasn't necessarily expecting to play. Um, I kind of came in with the mindset like, all right, I kind of know how this goes in a sense. Like I probably won't see playing time till like sophomore, junior year. At least that's what I thought. Um, but I got thrown in pretty early. I remember I got a I got a few plays uh, the very first game of the year that uh, freshman season versus Garner, um, and I believe uh, we actually I think we were ranked before coming into that game. I want to say, um, so I thought in my head I'm like, oh, we might be you know, we might be a pretty tough team. Um, but as it went, we were uh, <laughs> a little below the standard of uh, who we were playing against. Um, but it was definitely an interesting thing because. I, uh, it might be bad to say, but JV was a lot more appealing to me than varsity was. Um, I remember one game, uh, in JV, I got taken out. Um, it was by the third quarter because you had to save quarters for varsity, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I just remember being pretty mad about it. Cause I was like, <laughs> I was like, man, I just want to play JV. We're winning here. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but it was, a. Uh, I don't know. It was a really, um, I guess, humbling experience. And that kind of uh, motivated us going into sophomore year. Um, I remember that Lake Mills game, the first or second game, technically, I think it was of the sophomore year where uh, we finally got that win after going 0-10, essentially. Um, and that was uh, that was kind of the start of everything from there for me. So, yeah, that was exciting. Historically, we lost in the playoffs in 2012 lose nine straight games in 2013, then lose the Garner in 2014. That's an 11 game losing streak that, you know, Britt West Hancock's not accustomed to. If we lost two games in a row, people are like, oh my goodness, the, you know, the sky is falling type of thing. And it was a tough stretch, but um, I've said it many times on this podcast, the way coach Sanger and coach Perkins handled that season is just admirable because it's one thing that, you know, things are going well, things are going well, but when things aren't going well, how do you respond to it? How do how do the kids react? What's what's going to happen to the program? And uh, just kudos to everybody on that team. I in the book I wrote about football and wrestling, I spent several pages writing about that 2013 season and how you guys and the coaches responded because I was like, that was the last year we missed the playoffs, you know. And now from 14 to now, look at what's happened. And and like that could have been the season where things just shut down and kids stopped caring and kids stopped putting the work in and the, and coaches could have been like, well, you know, we've done this for 40 some years. It's time to hang her up. And and no one wanted to, to end that dynasty like that, that we've had. So um, yeah. what were your, um, what were kind of your first impressions of playing for coach Bob Sanger and, and Gene Perkins, especially as a freshman Did they have high expectations for you where the understanding of he's a young guy, let's ease him in. What were you, what was it like to play for those two legends? Oh man, uh, I guess really, where do I start? I think it. Uh, um, I just remember in middle school going. I used to go into Casey's where uh, Brady Wilson's chiropractor office is now. I don't even remember that, but um, I, I would go in there with my mom's on Saturday morning. I'd see Coach Bob in there every now and then. And I'm like, I was kind of starstruck, you know what I mean? Because in Brett, that guy is that guy's everybody's hero, legend kind of thing, you know, and. Uh, I was uh, very excited to play for him. And I remember my brother, um, we spent many, many hours uh, on that practice field, throwing the ball around. Um, he would uh, 
I think he'd let me win quite a few times because he'd kick the ball off to me or whatever, and I'd try to run it back, whatever. He made me feel good a couple times, but he also let me have it too. If I didn't catch the ball, uh, I heard it from him. So, um, but he uh, he always told me about Coach Bob and Coach Gene and kind of the importance of uh, the program and um, you know how uh, how heavily respected those those two were. So I came in with a mindset of um, I don't know. I was, it was more of like an admiration thing. I wanted to do my best at all times. Um, you know, make sure I didn't make any wrong moves here or there. Obviously mistakes are made. Um, but they were very understanding. I feel like, uh, freshman year, especially for me and overall as a team, like you said uh, a little bit earlier there, they handled that season very, very well. Um, and it wasn't, it was never a problem with the coaching. It, it never was that. It was more of a structure thing between us players. So um, they handled that with uh, a real humility. Um, coach Gene, obviously, uh, defensive coach for me. I, I love playing for Coach Gene, um, Coach Perkins there. Uh, yeah, and he made it a lot of fun, too. I remember Coach Hagan was talking about Coach Perkins and how he's a, you know, he's a very humorous guy, very quick-witted. Um, he made playing for him really fun. I was uh, I was completely blessed to be able to play under both those guys. So, yeah. And what I always respected about Coach Perkins was, I mean, he knew he's forgotten more about defense than any of us will ever know. Yet he never mm -hmm. overcomplicated what he had us do out there on the field. He, you know, you, you have a job. You have you know two things you got to look for, or whatever. You know, you're going left. You're going right. You got this guy to key on. He never made it made Joe have to overthink it out there. He overthought it himself and knew I this is this kid's strength. He needs to do this. And mm -hmm. you know, within the system, I always appreciated that about him. I gotta go back to your brother. You mentioned Jake. He yeah. was a freshman when I was a senior and I was a captain on that team. And uh I don't know <laughs> if you know this, but Jake and a few of those other guys tended to get in a little bit of trouble at school. And oh yeah. There was a couple of practices where Coach Sanger pretty much said to us four captains, take care of these guys. And Jake, was, <laughs> he'll, he'll cry watch this. He knows. He was one of the repeat offenders for the first few weeks of the <laughs> season until they uh, until they figured it out and they we ran them to death a little bit. So, um, yeah, he, he was uh, he, he was kind of a wild man. I've heard stories. I've heard I've heard plenty of stories throughout his four years uh, from the guys who have played with him. Um, yeah, I hope you guys ran them to death. They they needed that. They really did. Him and Wester, I guarantee you, was yeah. those two. Yeah, I know. I wish I remember I what the circumstances were that got them their detentions or whatever. I can't remember what the details were, but I just remember Coach me like, get it figured out, guys. Come on, like run it out of them. And it took it took probably two or three times of up downs and uh, what was it where you do the 10 yard run and you do a somersault 10 yard somersault we used to do those and do a few of those and yeah they they kind of figured it out so <laughs> so yeah freshman year statistically uh for you you had 124 carries uh for 473 rushing yards and six touchdowns which was good for 36 points uh all you know your rushes your yards your touchdowns and your points that led the team as a freshman and then you had 50 tackles defensively which was second on the team uh what do you do you remember just like I just remember as a sophomore I got thrown in a couple times in garbage time you know when we're up 40 nothing going out there and be like holy crap these guys are fast do you remember the speed of the game being an issue as a freshman right away yeah, you were fast yeah a little bit I, I would say I would definitely say a little bit I I could definitely tell there's uh there was levels to it I remember um that very first game I, uh, I tried to tackle Braden Mainz, who was a pretty standout athlete at Garner. And I thought I had him pretty wrapped up, not a chance. So uh, like, I, I understood there was definitely levels to it. Um, but I feel like, I feel like I adapted fairly well um, just because I don't know. I, I feel like we were in a position with nothing to lose essentially at one point in the season. So it was like, you know, I'm going to just going to go out there and do what I can. Um, and, you know, it, it worked out pretty well, I suppose, for personally, but not team wise, I suppose. But, um, yeah, no, there was definitely levels to the, to that game there. I could definitely tell who were the, who were the upper class when I was playing and who were more on my level. Um, but yeah, I mean, I remember pretty much every game from that season and it was, uh, 
yeah, it was a little rough at, at points, but um, let's kind of bring that up. Those, some of those scores here, uh, because this was not yeah. like Wes Hancock football tradition. 56 nothing loss at Garner, 46 nothing loss home against St. Ansgar, 35 nothing loss at AGWSR, 36 to nothing loss at home against Belmond, 42 to 6 loss at home against Garrigan. And then a 54 nothing loss at Lake Mills. So six points in six games scored. And we're usually, you know, averaging 40 some points a game. Um, just going through those schools, Garner, St. Ansgar, and then Belmont, Garrigan, and Lake Mills, you know, that's kind of like a revenge tour, you know, because those were the schools. I know St. Ansgar always kind of had our number in that decade or so, but we uh, typically handled those teams throughout the decades pretty handily and when those schools saw ooh, they're down yeah did you kind of could you kind of sense and feel that they're like if we can run it up on Wes Hancock we're we're running it up on Wes Hancock oh yeah I sense that because uh watching my brother play watching Chad Iceman play obviously I was you know best friends with Ben growing up and watching Chad play um I was very uh aware of the fact that like we are the team on the other end of the stick usually right I mean, we're the team that's running it up. We're we're no mercy kind of kind of team. So, um, I felt that I definitely did. And I mean, props to those teams. Like that was their chance to get it in, and they got it in on us. Uh, but after that, it really never happened again. So, I mean, they, other than Garner, I suppose we, and St. Anne's here, um, never really beat those two in my high school four years. But um, when it comes to like Lake Mills, and uh, we never played AGWSR again. But. Uh, yeah, I think we uh no, they definitely they did they took advantage of it. So I can't blame them for it. I don't but... blame, they said, you know, I don't blame them either. That happens. I mean, sure. Yeah. They get their licks while they can, but you guys ended the season um you still lost those last three games but a 22 to 20 loss to Southeast Webster on the road, 44 to 22 loss at home against Prairie Valley and then a 42-31 shootout loss at Newman to end the year. So you guys you were building some traction as at the end of that year. Um, weren't just getting shut out and beat by 40 or 50. Those games were competitive and fairly close. Could you kind of feel like, hey, next year we're going to be a lot better uh, just based on how the, the that season ended? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, Real quick before I go into that, was Prairie Valley, was that Roland's story at one point? Or was no, it Prairie, Prairie Valley? Prairie, it was always Prairie Valley, and now they're joined with Southeast Webster, and they are Southeast Valley is what they are. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I was a little, uh, I was confused on that one, but um, yeah, I remember that Prairie Valley game. It was tied at halftime. We were tied at halftime and that was like my moment where I was like, you know what? We're really not, you know, as far behind as we think we are. Um, You know, I think we, there was those, like uh, those last teams you mentioned there, Southeast Webster, for sure. We definitely could have won that game and shout out to, uh, I just want to shout out Sam Patterson quick. He brought um him and his college buddies from Iowa state. I remember that very vividly. They brought uh, just a bunch of dudes, college guys, um, and they were they were in the stands, and uh, they made that game pretty memorable. It was like uh, the first time we, you know, obviously had a close matchup, um, but yeah, I remember those guys were just going nuts in the stands. So that was that was kind of a cool uh, <laughs> introduction to that kind of thing. But um, yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, we definitely got the feeling that we knew we were going to be, well, you can't get worse than that. Right. I mean, you know, we knew we weren't going to be zero and nine ever again. Mm -hmm. Only one way to go. And that's up at that point. Yep. And that's, that's kind of the decision we made. Um, So yeah. Yeah. Yep. And yeah, 2014, your sophomore year, you guys go from zero and nine in 2013 to five and five, which again, still technically isn't up to Wes Hancock standards, but when you go from 09 to five and five, that's, that's a big jump and uh, hosted a first round playoff game. I remember Jared Patterson from the Globe Gazette put out a little thing that says the man can still coach. And it says, you know, Bob Sanger in his 45th year or whatever it was, um, went from an 0 and 9 season to now he's hosting a, a playoff game. Um, obviously we lost that game to Denver 35 to 14. If you're a, a history buff for Wes Hancock football, but the fact that we are, were in the playoffs, hosted a playoff game, what was kind of your mindset? Did you guys put the time in in the off season? Did you guys change the mindset? Practice was different. What do you remember going from freshman to sophomore in that five-game swing? Uh, I remember 
I mean, I don't want to say this with like any animosity towards like the upperclassmen freshman year, but like I vividly remember sophomore year, there was more sense of leadership from, you know, upperclassmen. And that's really kind of where we were lacking freshman year. Um, and that's not to say anything about anybody. I mean, that's just what it was. So um, we had that leadership there and we had, we still had quite a few young guys playing as well. Like Colton Francis came in as a freshman. He was playing quite a bit at fullback. Um, we, you know, we could have been district champ. I mean, like we could have been district champ sophomore year. Like we, we played Nashville very closely and shout out to Connor Sonius threw me a perfect ball. I, I dropped that one. I probably should have caught that one, but it was like, uh, that was a, that was kind of a brawl over Nashua because I think we all understood that like, we're, we're a pretty dang good team. And we have like a, we have a real chance for teams that um, are pretty solid. And we, we kind of realized that pretty early, I'd say. So after we beat Lake Mills, like that Lake Mills game, like I remember being on the bus and we were going, we were just going nuts. Everybody was going nuts because we, we felt like we were back in a sense. Like we understood now, like, Hey, we can compete. And we can definitely beat some teams. So, um, yeah, no, it was more of a, I don't know. Everybody just kind of understood it and we were all kind of on the same page. So it kind of flowed very well. I'd say. Yeah. yeah. Compare here in 2013, you lost to Garner 56, nothing in 2014, you lost 19 to 16, still a loss, but better than 56 point loss. Uh, Lake Mills, you went from losing 54 to nothing to winning 40 to 28. Like the, what you just talked about and breaking that 11 game losing streak. Um, other comparable teams, we played Newman at the end of the last season, lost to him by 11. We beat him by 19. Uh, still lost to Belmont. Back-to-back losses to Belmont. I don't think that's happened since about the 70s. Uh, <laughs> instead of 36 nothing, it was 33-20. to And is, was that about the time they had that – was it Corby Sander? Did he Was he on that team? Do you remember him as a – Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They had Corby Sander and Luke Warden, uh, Tanner Mainz. Um, those guys would have been juniors at the time. Uh, yeah, that was uh, kind of their nucleus. Corby was producing very highly for him. I don't, he probably did um, my, my freshman year. I, he probably played quite a bit. I assume I can't really remember that game, but um, no, yeah, he was, yeah. Corby was a stud and yeah, yeah. he was very he, hard to get a hold of. So yeah, like I said, he ended up playing at UNI. So, you know, he was pretty good. And yes. that's it. the big game. I can, I looked at comparing scores, Garrigan 2013, you guys lost 42 to six. And at the end of the regular season in 2014, you beat them 28 to six. And Garrigan was going through a good stretch in that 2010s decade. Uh, they had some very good teams. Um, mm-hmm. And then, like I said, we lost to Denver 35 to 14 in the first round in a home playoff game. They went to the semis that year. I just remember them. those two years they had dome teams. They were just massive up front. Do you remember that Denver line you had to play against? I remember that line. I remember their. Uh, I remember their running back number seven. Don't know his name. He was pretty good. Number ten. Another running back. He went to Upper Iowa. Played linebacker. Very good athlete. Um, they were a very stellar team. Very stellar team. So, and they were they were similar to us, and they just wanted to, they just wanted to run the ball and pound it. They oh were, yeah. yeah, they were not fancy. Um, statistically, you were second on the team in rushing. You were first last year, the year before, as a freshman. He had 790 yards on 141 carries and nine touchdowns. Got the record book out here. Dalton Bates, 251 carries for 981 yards and 14 touchdowns. And you mentioned Colton Francis. He had 548 yards and five touchdowns. Connor Sonius had 230 yards. Trevor Nalen even ran the ball a little bit, and he, he was more of a tight end. Um, <laughs> you uh, had scored 70 points, had 89 tackles. Uh, the 89 tackles was tops on the team. Uh, what position? I'm assuming you played linebacker, correct? If my memory serves me right. Yeah. So freshman year, I played outside linebacker, and then um, uh, sophomore year, I actually went on the inside next to Trevor, which was a lot of fun. Me and Trevor, uh, we kind of controlled the a gaps. It was a lot of fun that year with him. And I actually got moved on offense from fullback freshman year to three back. So. I didn't see as many carries, I don't think. Um, actually, I might have. I guess you just read them off. I don't. I can't exactly remember the numbers, but I got moved to running back. So um, you yeah. actually had more carries, but um, oh, even our offense, <laughs> a lot of times, is the two and the three back. You're you're setting up the fullback. You have to get to the edge, and um, sometimes you take might take a loss on a play, but it's it's setting up the inside, and then eventually, when that inside's established, then the outside's established. So I always say sometimes the numbers get a little 
get a little skewed. So yeah, I was doing a little more horizontal running uh, sophomore year than I was uh, freshman year, I think. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. There was they always say fullbacks the most fun because it's just north and south and go. Oh uh, man, the best, the best. Yeah. Uh, what was your favorite play to run as a fullback or running back when they when you heard this play? What was that play that you knew like here we go? Yeah, fullback, 242 trap for sure. I feel like we set traps up really, really well, whether it was 242 trap, uh, 343 trap, um, or, you know, 236 trap or whatever it was. But I I really like 242 trap. I feel like it gave me more room to, um, instead of kind of plowing through and bulldozing for three yards, you kind of had more of an opening to make a little move or whatnot. But um, really like that one. And then I'd say for three back, I was more of a, I was more of a 236 man. I wasn't, I, I wouldn't say I was like necessarily fast enough. Like if they called 238, like you're really trying to get to that sideline kind of thing. And I, I wasn't like the fastest guy. Like I was all right speed, but um, I feel like 236 gave me more of a chance to almost play like a fullback in a way. Cause I'm cutting up early essentially. Yeah. And then I, you know, I have more, more field to make moves with and, uh, um, yeah, really love 240, 236. So that was, that was a lot of fun. I, I just, I had a thought here. I've done probably 60 of these podcasts where we talk West Hancock football and almost every single one of them, I, you know, a play gets brought up and I've never had anyone go, what was that play called where we, it was more of like to the outside and we pulled, it's like instantly every guy goes 238 trap, 236 trap, 327 trap, two, 245 dive. It's like no one, if you've played five years ago or 40 years ago, Everybody remembers the play. Um, oh yeah. What, oh, yeah. what was the fair play? Two forty-five dive. You don't even have to hesitate. You we we know that <laughs> playbook inside and out. Still, um, are the, those base plays? Um, mm-hmm. that, just, that just cracked me up when you were saying it. You didn't even hesitate when you said two forty-two trap. It was just. Oh yeah, no, yeah. that'll be embedded maybe. in my brain forever. I think so. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know, I did a podcast with the nineteen fifty-six wrestling team. And the coach was like 93 years old. And his son was like, ah, he, he's not having a good day mentally. I don't know if he's going to remember anything. And as soon as I said, hey, coach, what do you remember about the 1954 wrestling season? He goes, oh, we lost to Clarion by three that year. It's just like, <laughs> it doesn't matter how old you are, how, you know, whatever health issues are going on. For some reason, high school sports stuff just sticks. So, um, yeah. And I think it's a, uh not just high school sports sticks, but I think if it's West Hancock high school sports, it's kind of a whole different story. You know what I mean? It's, uh, yep. I don't know. It yeah. just mean, means a little bit more. So it does mean a little bit more. I agree with that. So you're, uh, your junior season, 2015, you're now an upperclassman. You're probably one of those leaders since, especially since you played quite a bit, you guys go from zero and nine to five and five to seven and three. So another two game improvement, um, still just in the first round of the playoffs, which, you know, you look back to the history of West Hancock football, first round, didn't lose in the first round a lot. But if you look at it in the in the light of we were 0-9 just less than two years ago, and we're now we're back-to-back playoffs, um, hosting another playoff game. That, that's a pretty big deal. Um, lost to Garner by eight. Like you said, you just couldn't – that Garner bug just – there was a stretch there where we just couldn't get them. Beat Lake Mills 39 nothing. Beat North Union 47-8. Went to Clarion, who was a 2A school and beat them 45 to eight, got some payback against Nashua, 38-22. Uh, Newman, I think that was an overtime game, 34-26. And weren't they up, they were up by a couple touchdowns, weren't they in that game when we came back? They were, and I didn't play that game. Vicente didn't, Vicente Gonzalez didn't play that game. Ricky got hurt, Ibera, Ricky got hurt that game. Um, I think Dallas Pearson might've been hurt that game already. Uh, we had players out that game, and that was a very, uh, that was a dog fight. That was a dog fight of a game. Yeah, I think that was, was that one of the games where Connor threw for a lot of yards. I think I remember in the record book that was maybe the game where he got himself up there in the passing charts. Yes, yeah. I think and it then, was. Um, Belmont 26 21 when Forby Sander got hurt, I believe. First yep. half, early first half of the game. And, you know, that, they were kind of, we we're, we we're having a hard time stopping him. And then, he yeah. gets hurt, and you know the way some people look at it. Go if he wasn't hurt, you know Belmont would have won. I was like, well, nothing you can do about it now. So the I, I guess we'll never know. I suppose, right? You know, North Butler forty-two nothing win. 
Uh, then there was a 26 to eight loss at Garrigan before the playoffs. What do you remember about that Garrigan game? I remember uh, they had a gigantic fullback, Langerman. Uh, can't remember his first name. He was a beast. He was an absolute stud. Um, they had a really solid team that year. They really did. Uh, yeah, because previously, the year before, we beat them 28-6. Was that the score? Um, I, I yeah, believe. 28-6. So it was about the exact same score, yeah. They pretty much flip-flopped. Um, yeah. yeah, that was a tough team. I think uh, I, th- I believe Wadley – uh, the coach's son was running quarterback. Um, he was a good athlete. Yeah, they had a lot of good athletes. That was a uh, that was a tough game to lose because no one likes losing to Gary. But uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then uh, you guys get to the playoffs. Uh, another home game, like I said, Grundy Center. Who if you follow West Hancock football now? We all know Grundy Center from the last four or five years. Uh, close yeah. twenty four to sixteen loss. Do you remember having chances to? To win that game, what was the kind of the setup of that game? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I first thing I remember is it was um, weather wise, climate wise, it was not a very fun game to play in. Uh, it's very cold, snowing, spitting, um, kind of you know had all the um, factors of weather into it. Not that that was you know affected really too much of it. I don't think. I mean, we're, we're kind of used to the cold, I suppose, but. Um, yeah, we definitely had a chance. I think, you know, because they didn't score their second touchdown – or not their second, their last touchdown until the fourth quarter late, I think. So it was – I think we were pretty close to tied, I believe, and then they scored and, you know, that was that. But, mm-hmm. yeah, I think that was a pretty – I mean, that was a dogfight all game long. Nobody could really throw it, essentially. Uh, I know they weren't throwing it too much anyways. They had Bryce Flater, who was an absolute stud of a running back. Um, went to UNI, played linebacker, did very well. Um, yeah, they had big linemen too. I remember that. They had some big boys. Yeah. Um, I put in my notes here. I think this is when everyone was like, I think Wes Hancock football is back. You know, yeah. back, back playoff appearances. We got one from oh, zero wins, we're racking up to at least seven. You know, seven and two ended up, used to be like the bad season. You know, we'd go nine and two, nine and one, 11 and one, occasional seven and two season. I think people were feeling pretty good about the program. Um, and then your, uh, senior year is you guys made the quarterfinals. We'll get to that in a minute. We have not, not made the quarterfinals or better since your senior year, 2016 to 2023 quarterfinals, semifinals or state title game every single year. So uh, that's a pretty cool streak you guys started. Um, but statistically, uh, you didn't have quite the stats as the previous two years, just 76 carries. Uh, what what was the reasoning for the your carries kind of being cut in half? Just depth of the team? Were you injured a little bit? What was the story there? Yeah, I was having knee issues, and it was the it was the same knee that I I had a wrestling season sophomore year actually at the De Leon tournament. I was wrestling Bodie Garnier from Sumner, Fredericksburg, tore my meniscus, and you know if I could go back on it, I would have still finished out the season, but I I didn't. Um, got a scope on the on the knee. And then um, what's funny about that is I, I wrestled that Bodie kid three years in a row. He was actually the kid I beat at state junior year to get on the podium, but I wrestled him three years in a row. Um, good wrestler, but yeah, I, I tore my meniscus sophomore season of wrestling. And then that uh, junior year of football, I tore it again. And then I wasn't supposed to be really running the ball, but I, it was a thing where like, I should be, and I, I needed to essentially, and I, I wanted to. So um, I didn't get it as much, obviously. They were kind of trying to prevent possible, um, you know, more damage to it or whatever. But, uh, yeah, I wasn't quite as mobile after that, um, for that season at least. Um, so, yeah, dealt with a little bit of knee stuff going on. But And the nice part, you have Colton Francis and Dalton Bates. I mean, so it's like <laughs> it's like if Jordan Wyland goes down, oh, crap, season's over. He's like, no, you, you, it's a pretty nice situation to be in when you're the third option, essentially, you know. Amen. Connor Sonius at quarterback could run a little bit. He had 191 yards. Colton had 999 yards. And then uh, Dalton had 933. So if you got, I mean, if you were fully healthy, there just there's not enough footballs to go around in that backfield. No, um, there isn't. We were absolutely blessed to have those two in the backfield. Um, 
yeah, both complete workhorses, man. It was, uh, yeah, we are blessed with that. So and you still managed, um, 69 tackles on defense had a punt return for a touchdown, uh, just still a weapon on the field, even though maybe you weren't at a hundred percent. So, um, then your senior year was your breakout year. And like I said, it was the year you guys made it to the quarterfinals, got that playoff win and, uh, started the streak of eight straight years of quarterfinals or better. Uh, we've gone quarterfinals, quarterfinals, semifinals, state title, quarterfinals, state title, runner-up, state title. I mean, that's just crazy eight-year run. Not a lot of schools, I don't think, in Iowa. I don't think they've uh, – I, I would probably guess we might be, I don't know, one of five, maybe not even five that have done that. Yeah. Quarterfinals are better. Yeah, for that I've, uh, I've done a little research on like just state title games in general. It's us and like 12 other schools in the history of the state that have been to 10 or more title games. And yeah, if you really wanted to break it down and even go back to like quarterfinal rounds, it's hard to find a, you know, more than probably a, a dozen or two teams that are as consistent as we are. And right. You can stretch that back to the eighties, you know, like since 84, I think we've been in 33 of 38 playoffs or something. Like just, crazy like that's that. nuts that is nuts and we we tend to dwell on the negatives in the program oh remember that game we lost and it's like yeah but we won 10 of them that year and people don't want you don't talk about hardly any of the wins it's mostly the the close losses that we ended up talking about so it's just 100 percent. just how it goes so yeah you guys started your senior year another loss to garner um three points 23 to 20 at home beat belmont beat north butler and then 61-6 win over West Fork. You got Grundy in the regular season, beat them 44-26. Took it to Newman, 52-13. A big 65-6 win at Rockford. And then ran into St. Ansgar. It was a couple really good St. Ansgar teams that they had in the late 2010s. 28-20 loss at St. Ansgar. What do you remember? Again, we're talking about the losses. We just breeze past the wins. We get to the losses. <laughs> Do you remember <laughs> yeah, about right. the, uh, the close loss there before a 63 nothing win over Nashua? Yeah, unfortunately, we, uh, you know, tend to remember some of them losses a little bit more. Um, yeah, I I remember the first play of the uh, offense. We, we went and scored, and it wasn't like – I don't know. Everybody was pretty locked in. So it wasn't like, um, you know, I feel like some teams might get a little complacent after that thinking like, Oh, it's, it might be a cakewalk, but no, it was, we knew they were tough. We knew they were a tough team. Um, and so we were pretty locked in the whole game. Um, man, they had some, they had some really good athletes. I mean, their quarterback, Ben Bergeron, he was, he was a stud. They had a, they had a tight end, um, who was pretty massive. They had some good, uh, running backs, uh, Parker, Hendrickson, I think it was. Um, Dayton Smith was a fullback. I think they had a, yeah, they were a tough team and it was chippy out there. It was, it was getting chippy a little bit, but that was a tough loss. That was a really, that was the game we felt like we probably should have won. Um, but obviously you say that now, you know, we didn't, but yeah. yeah. As you bounce back, like I said, 63 nothing win over Nashua, who just two years ago, beat you you know you're lost to them and uh, 63 nothing and that's the thing that gets me about west hancock football is there's a lot of programs that will have one good year where they go eight and two make the playoffs and they're four and five maybe one and eight oh we have a good class coming in we're seven and two nashua was kind of that program they they have a good team mm -hmm. every once in a while then they're down that's what's always impressed me about our program is since the the early 80s we've been above average except for couple seasons here and there but then we bounce back and we're in winning state titles again so yes yeah. that's a good comparison of you know our programs here and it's always here and then programs are just kind of up and down up and down so but 100%. You a, another home playoff game so 2014 15 and 16 you get a host first round game this time you guys finally break through you beat hudson 30 to 7 what do you remember about the hudson playoff game um i remember the first quarter we were at, or not first quarter, it was first half. We were absolutely dominant. Uh, we were moving the ball very well. Defense was playing very well. Um, even with 30 to seven win, I fumbled on the, like the two or one or two yard line um, in like the second quarter, I think. So, I mean, like it could have been, you know, a little more, but uh, yeah, we were, uh, we were dominant and we knew 
I think we knew kind of our worth that season, um, especially that loss to St. Ansgar that kind of fired us up a little bit. Um, Cause we, we knew we were better than that. Uh, but yeah, that would, that felt really good to get that under our belt because like you said, you know, losing two first round games the past two years, like we were, I mean, there was a little bit of like, Oh man, is this kind of a thing we're not going to be able to break, but um, we had a really, really good team. So we were able to get past that. And yeah. And then your last game as an Eagle got to the quarterfinals. So you got to be happy that we got to that next round. Yeah. But losing to Garrigan is never a fun thing. 12 to eight. Talk about mm-hmm. November 4th, 2016 at Elgona, four point loss to Garrigan in your career. Yeah, that was, uh, that was extremely, extremely tough uh, pill to swallow by the time the whistle blew at the end of the game. And um, yeah, I felt like, we were pretty much in control almost the whole game. It felt like, you know, it was eight to six coming into half. And then, you know, they scored two touchdowns in the second half and, or no one touchdown in the second half, my bad. Um, we, I don't know. There was a feeling that like it was, our, it, it almost seemed like it was our game to lose or win. And, you know, we lost it. But uh, one thing I, I remember really well is that very last drive where we had a chance to, uh, you know, score and win the game. Coach Coach Bob let Dylan take over on the plays, and I think that was one of the best decisions he's probably made that year. Because um, Dylan absolutely let us down that field. Like, talk about talk about a great leader, uh, Dylan Eccles. You know, and a great quarterback, a great safety. You know, one of the hardest hitting kids on the team. If not even one of, he probably was. I'd put him the hardest hitting kid on the team, which is kind of weird saying our quarterback is, but it was true. You know, so uh, yeah, that was an extremely tough game, and I think we had you know little chances here and there on that last drive to maybe put it away. Um, but you know, as it would, you know, have it, we did not. And, uh, yeah, that was tough seeing Garrigan in the dome that year because we, you know, they made the finals and they lost a close one in the finals, but like we were all in the stands like, man, we should probably be here. You know, I think we're probably a top four team and we should probably be in the dome right now, but you know, can't really play the what ifs game, I suppose, but. Yeah, yeah, and we've had lots of those seasons where we get just short of the dome, just short of the title game, and then you watch that team that beat you and you go, oh, we would have, you know, we would have matched up better with this team. We would, you know, all those, all those woulda, coulda, shouldas, but a dangerous game to play. Yeah, it is. It is. So, yeah, uh, statistically here, and then we'll get to some some of your teammates and coaches and stories and stuff. Uh, Hundred and thirty seven carries. For 1,363 rushing yards, that is a 9.9 average for uh, yards per carry. Uh, just that, Every time you touch the ball, it was pretty much a first down is what that means. Uh, you had 20 rushing touchdowns. Uh, Colton Francis, uh, so you had 137. He had 173 carries. So you swapped the, the ones place and the tens place. He had 1,307 yards. So you guys – Almost had this, you know, you had, what, 56 more yards than him? He had 30-some more carries. Um, again, it's just a different style of play. The fullbacks, the bruiser, three yards in a cloud of dust. You were getting more to the outside. I just thought those were interesting how the numbers were so close. Um, but mm-hmm. you did uh, a little bit more on a lot less uh, needing the ball. Um, he, like I said, had 17 touchdowns. Dylan Eccles that you mentioned, 57 carries, 396 yards. Bennett Bruins stepped in as a, as a young guy, uh, 38 carries, 216 yards. Uh, McCoy Yakel uh, jumped in, and he ended up being one of the most explosive players we've seen, especially on the return game. Uh, and then some guys named Joseph Smith and Tate Hagen, those young guys as freshmen <laughs> that ended up winning a state title were also on that team and stepped in when they needed to. Uh, he had a kick return for a touchdown as well. You scored 144 points on the season, had 129 tackles. Um, again, overall, I, I count your senior season statistically as one of the best individual seasons we've ever seen. And more importantly, you guys were that team that got us over the hump, you know, from that 0-9 season to a touchdown away from the Dome. And like you said, who knows, maybe even a state championship game appearance. So you, your group was kind of that group that said, hey, we experienced the the lowest of the lows and got the program back to where it was, and now look where it is today. So um, 
obviously you weren't the guys on the field winning titles the last couple of years, but I think when you look at the the wholeness of our program, your class, your senior class deserves a lot of credit for not being that group that just kind of like said, screw it. You know, we give up, we're not good. So why bother putting the work in you guys? You stuck with it and I think deserve more credit than you get. So, uh, you had three 500 plus yard rushing seasons, which is tied for a school record. Uh, you're still sixth in career rushing yards with 3,088. Only Chris Schlugger, Tate Hagen, Zach Schlugger, Cole Kelly, and Joseph Smith have more yards than you. So that's, that's a pretty impressive list, you know, that top six there. Um, you're also sixth in career rushing touchdowns with 39. Tate, Chris, Zach, Cole, and Kale Zool are, uh, make that top six. Another pretty impressive group of people to be lumped in with. You had 50 or more tackles all four seasons. The list of people who have done that, as well as you, Zach Schlugger and Matthew Francis is the entire list. Just you three have done that. Your third in career tackles. You had 337 tackles in your career. That's 10 better than current head coach Mark Sanger. You were 22 tackles away from Matthew Francis in second place. And Nick Horseman was the he's the all-time lean tackler with 375. So that Nick Horseman, Matthew Francis, Jordan Weil, and Mark Sanger. That's again quite the quite the list. Um you're also on the list um of most seasons with hundred plus tackles. You and just six other guys have ever gotten hundred or more. Uh you're also on the list with just Nick Horseman, Corey Mattoon, Mark Sanger, Lou Banker, and Colton Harms to have 125 or more tackles in a season. Um, just, I could have probably kept going with some stuff, but I cut it off and said, eh, it's a pretty good list to be a bunch of lists to be on. So, uh, what yeah. do you think of all that? What are some good stories from your football days? Who are some teammates you want to shout out? Locker room stories, coach talk, all those things. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'm very honored to be on those lists with, uh, all those guys you mentioned. There's kind of a, uh, I think a familiar pattern on the offensive side of the ball. Um, and I remember uh, just kind of throwing it back a little bit. I was in seventh grade. Colton Francis was in sixth grade. And this is back when they used to make senior videos. I don't know if you guys did it when you were in high school or not, but um, it was Zach Schlugger's senior year. Uh, he made, um, he was making a, he was making a senior video and he wanted me and Colton to be in it and kind of almost role play as him and Zach essentially. Um, and, it was like a, it was kind of a video where we walked in the side doors uh, closest to the track. Um, and we walked in the doors we're like, man, so this is high school and kind of acting like Zach and Chris, you know, when they were just coming in and um, you know, that was kind of my first introduction into that kind of world. And I always remember I was like over the moon about it because I watched, you know, Zach growing up uh, run the ball. And I, I knew, um, that's who I kind of wanted to implement my game after on the offensive side of the ball and defensive. Uh, he's a very good linebacker as well, obviously. Um, so that was kind of cool uh, being a part of that and um, being a part of that list, watching Horseman uh, play with my brother. Um, he was an absolute animal. I also got beat up by him quite a bit growing up. He was good friends with my brother. So he was always at the house and I had my fair share of uh, licks by those guys, um, which probably, was good for me, I suppose. But um, yeah, I'm uh, absolutely honored to be on the list with those guys for sure. And Matthew as well. Um, absolute, uh, just a stud of an athlete, even greater guy. He's a good kid. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, shouting out guys that I played with and um, some of my teammates, you know, I, I want to give a huge shout out to, uh, you know, Dylan Eccles. I think Dylan was, uh, you know, very instrumental in our senior season of our success. Um, you know, being quarterback and playing safety, like, or I said it earlier, I'm going to say it again. Like no one was more excited to put their nose in a play than Dylan, like on defense. Like if, if you, if you heard a crack, it was probably Dylan, you know, hitting somebody, um, him or Ben Iceman, Ben, ben liked to put the hit on people too. And I got, a, I got lucky enough to play next to Ben, uh, senior season at the linebacker position um but yeah also Colton Francis I mean me and Colton essentially played next to each other for three years in the backfield um him coming in freshman year obviously and 
Colton was an absolute monster and it, you know, if I ever needed a break, we were there with Colton. If Colton ever needed a break, they were there with me. So it was kind of the perfect one, two punch I'd say. Um, and I was really uh, blessed to have him next to me in the backfield there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I could shout out a million guys. Our line was very impressive senior year, especially, you know, uh, and I think that speaks volumes about, you know, our statistics that we got. Me and Colton, obviously, you know, you just read them off. You know, we had a pretty solid season, both of us. But, like, that line, man, they were they were fast. They were fat. We weren't big. I wouldn't say we were big by any means. Like, if when I think of, like, how many kids we had, maybe over 200 pounds, one, maybe, our center, you know, uh, Austin Brower. Uh, other than that, you know, those guys were just – they were lean and mean and fast. So, uh, Hunter Hagen, man – having him pull for me probably couldn't ask for better than that, you know? Um, and he's a kid who was just as fast as me playing guard. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, that worked out really well. Uh, but yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of guys I could shout out. I'm, I'm just happy that I got the, I got the chance to play with a lot of those guys and I'm still friends with quite a bit of them. Um, thankfully. And, uh, I don't see him as much anymore. You know, we're all kind of spread out you know, in the state and stuff, but, um, yeah, those are the best days of my life, man. You know, I, well, kind of, I shouldn't say that, you know, got a lot to look forward to, but, um, there's nothing quite like high school football with your best buddies, you know? And, uh, yeah, I'm just honored. I got the chance to do that with those guys. We were, uh, we were a very talented team, especially senior year. And, um, yeah, it was good. It's a good time. You still keep up with the program a little bit? I do. I do. Yep. I uh, actually live stream all the games every year and um, every Friday. So I've been, I've been keeping up on it and uh, yeah, it, it's been amazing to see the the success they've had um, really with, and since I left, um, you know, when I went to Dort, I think they played um, my freshman year at Dort, they played Akron Westfield. I think it was um, at Akron. Yep. So that was, that was kind of in my neck of the woods over in Sioux center. So I went to that game and, it was fun catching up with uh, Nick Hunt was there. He played uh, next to me senior year, actually, at uh, the linebacker position. We had a lot of fun. Uh, Nick was an awesome linebacker, um, awesome lineman as well, I should say. But, yeah, yeah. So, I, I remember watching that Akron game. I think they beat Akron, I believe, that year. It would be 2018. So that would probably actually be your sophomore year. Um, oh, yep, yep. You're right. Yep, uh, we beat them. Freshman and... year was West Sioux. West Sioux, and that was yeah. they were they were good. They had that Decker's kid that oh. played at Iowa State, and no one was beating them that year. Not a chance. Not yeah. a chance. Yeah, they were <laughs> loaded. <laughs> they were, and the the spread type of offense they ran, and they were they were they were running three A four A type stuff in Class A, and had the athletes to do it. So, yeah, I remember I I ended up actually uh, uh, playing with one of the kids. Uh, that was on that West Sioux team, Chase Koopmans. I think he might have been receiver for him or something, but very, very great athlete. And, uh, yeah, once I saw him, I was like, yeah, that team was – yeah, they had some big dudes. So, yeah, yeah they they were the complete package. Um, yeah. You you mentioned him earlier. You and Zach Schlugger, the yeah. only two Brit or West Hancock Eagles to ever be four-time all-conference or all-district. Um Again, that's the list. How many guys have been on the all district list twice or four times? Two guys, you and Zach. That's it. Um, 30 guys have been named three times, and 161 guys have been on the all district list twice. So, 193 people have been on an all district list two, three, or four times. Most of them were two timers. You know, 30 of them were three timers, just you and Zach were four timers. Um, and you were also a two-time All-State, or only 27 other Eagles have been um, two-timers, and only three guys have been three-time All-Staters. So pretty, pretty – Has there been any four-timer? Four no, four, no four-time All-Staters, just All-District. Uh, all right. All right. Uh, you know, think about it. Even in Class A, we talked about it's pretty rare to play as a freshman uh, – yeah unless it's out of absolute necessity you have you know 16 guys on the team and you just are glad to feel the team type of thing that Wes Hancock you know a lot of guys in the 80s and 90s didn't even play till their senior year essentially because there was just so many good guys in front of them and as our just you know our school districts got a little smaller 
of course, we've had to rely a little bit more on some of the younger guys, but even then, sometimes just as a sophomore, you know, it's it's really tough to to crack that. So yeah. let's talk a little wrestling here. Um, speaking of being on a pretty cool list, you're one of 260 state qualifiers in our storied wrestling program's history. Uh, talk about your experiences wrestling at West Hancock a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, wrestling season was uh, it was a blast. It really was, and um, you know, obviously there was times where it was not very fun um just because it's such a mentally draining sport in my opinion and you're you're cutting weight and you're you're practicing in 90 degree heat in the wrestling room and you know it's uh you're breaking out with the skin i had i had like uh skin stuff happen every year and i just couldn't seem to get rid of it so it, like you're doing you're dealing with a lot of um exterior factors almost in that sport and it really molds you uh into a better a better person better athlete um it really makes uh men out of boys essentially and i couldn't ask for a better coach i mean mark coach mark sanger our last state champion when i was in high school at least um with, before tate won it uh you know we were very very lucky to have him as our coach and um coach don i want to give a huge shout out to coach don me and him you know we had a lot of a lot of one-on-one -on -one wrestling opportunities and practice never took him down i don't think he uh yeah he, he he's he's kind of a broken body now i don't think he'd uh care about me saying that he's kind of a broken body but like i i've never really met someone more strong when it came to like grip strength he used his feet almost like they were hands it was uh i i hated wrestling coach don i love coach don don't get me wrong he's a great person great person but Every time I knew I had to wrestle with Coach Don, I was like, oh, here we go. Because he would just – he's just like a brick. He's almost like a brick, and then he gets his hands on you, it's over. He's uh, yeah. His grip strength is crazy. But, um, and me and him spent a lot of time off the mat as well, kind of in a mentor situation. You know, he helped me a lot with my faith and stuff like that. So, you know, when it came to coaches, Coach Brown, Coach uh, Billy, Coach Francis, um, yeah, we were very lucky with that with that coaching staff we had. So. And I was at districts this last year, and all those guys you just mentioned are still there. And now there's well, a younger group, Ethan Cronman and Matthew Francis, and some younger guys that are alumni as alumnus or whatever. And it's just so. And Dave Brown lives in Florida now, and he came back for it to be a part of things still. It's just, just a cool, just like the football program where it's a lot of guys that you know were a part of the program as players, and now they're a part of it as coaches. Um, you mentioned Coach Don and Coach Billy. Those are the, those two guys have been around forever. And like yeah. you, you wrestle a guy who's in his fifties or whatever, and you're like, I should beat him. And then you're like, Nope, not yeah. happening. And you're um, like, Oh, what is this old man strength right now? I was Billy. Billy still gets in there a little bit with the guys. Um, and Billy, and Billy, uh, I never wrestled Billy obviously because Bill Bill was pretty small. But uh, from the guys who did wrestle Billy, they were like, Man, his grip was just insane. Because I mean, Billy. Uh, Coach Dahlman, you know, grew up milking cows and still probably does it to this day. Um, he, you know, he had crazy, he had crazy hand strength, uh, just a good wrestler for the younger guys too. And we kind of um, struggle with lower weights, like finding guys to, you know, um, fill the weights um, below really 132, I think it was. Um, so, you know, for the guys that we did have, I think uh, there really wasn't a better – coach for those guys than coach Dahlman so did a, a younger coach Sanger ever wrestle at practice with you guys oh yeah oh yeah I, I wrestled coach Sanger quite a few times and uh I don't think I really competed I wouldn't even say compete even I probably didn't like compete until senior year with him and even then he was still he's just a different animal like <laughs> when it comes to wrestling man he is yeah, he was miles above me. I'll give him that. He was. He was. Yeah, I I wouldn't mess with him. Uh, he I will actually, know. just a quick story, quick. Uh, senior year in practice, we were doing uh, we were doing punt return, or no, we were doing punt. And he, was, he wasn't in pads, obviously. He was coaching, but, like, he lined up across from me, and I, I had to um, play the position, the up back almost, to where you're, uh, just making sure nobody blocks the kick or whatever. So I remember running down and I, I see him coming towards me. I'm like, all right, we're going to do it. He just lays me out. I'm like, oh <laughs> man, what a look. That that was very humbling for me. Cause like, 
I was riding a decent high of like, you know, having, you know, pretty good games and stuff. And then here's a, here's coach Sanger in his shorts and his t-shirt and just pops me on the ground. I'm oh. like, Oh geez. Yeah. No, he's a stud though. Well, I, I've told this on many podcasts and I apologize for like, Oh geez, he's telling the story for like the ninth time, but central college he's, you know, we're both central alums. I was a student coach. He was obviously all American 2013 him and Ryan Johnson are playing and they've both been out of college football for, you know, eight to 10 years at that point. And we're playing the actual central team. And, you know, granted the ones play a little bit, then the twos mix in and the threes. So you're not, you're not playing the, the, the starters the whole game, but you're playing college athletes. And after the game, I'm up in the coach's office and coach McMartin, the head football coach there says, do you know who the two best players on the field were tonight? Mark Sanger and Ryan Johnson. It's like the guys that haven't played in almost a decade were <laughs> destroying our kids. So, yeah. Isn't that nuts, though? I mean, yeah. and I, I it does not surprise me either because both of those guys were very, I mean, very involved still in weightlifting. And I remember Coach Coach Mark did a lot of uh, a lot of riding the bike, you know, a lot of miles on a bike with with Troy Hopshite. Um, but Coach Johnson in the weight room all the time, and yeah, those guys still move weight, you know, even at their age. Not saying they're old, but you know, they're getting up there, you know, come on. We're getting up there. Uh, you guys are getting up there a little bit. That's all right. Though. No, I, I stay with Mark every once in a while in the summer when I'm back home and stuff. And now they have three little kids. I'm like, I'm sure they're going to be like, no, no more people in the house. But uh, <laughs> I was passing out those books I wrote all day long to people in Britain. I'm tired and hurting and sore. And Mark had done something that day and his back was hurting. And we're sitting there just chilling, talking. He goes, we're getting old, aren't we? Every time either one of us stood up, it was just we're grunting and making noises and I'm like oh, <laughs> kids and everything else will do that to you. So the kids will do that to you. I, I think I've we, started I think we hit the hot that. tub and I'm like, yeah, we got it. Yeah. I can't, I can't. Feel it. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, back to wrestling. Uh, you took third in the conference in 2017. You got fourth in 2014, 2016. Uh, you won a sectional title and a district title in 2016, which would have been your uh, junior year. Uh, and then you went to state and placed eighth at 170 pounds. You won two matches, lost three. Talk about the uh, state tournament and getting to experience that. Oh, man. It was uh, that year, too. I was kind of all over the place when it came to my record. It was easily the worst coming into the tournament in my bracket. I was like 36 and 13 or something like that. You know, and you're seeing a lot of guys in the single digits with losses wise. Um, but uh I knew I knew I was a good wrestler. It, it was just more so like the confidence aspect of it because like I knew when a kid was not as good as me, but like when I came against you know other wrestlers that were you know probably the same ability wise as me, like I kind of took it a little more um, conservative, which I wish I you know would have opened up a little more, and that's kind of what me and Coach Mark tried to get me to do a little bit. But uh, that state tournament actually, I wrestled. Um, I lost the first match to Joey Schwinn from Bell Plain. Was a pretty good wrestler. I think he ended up seventh that year. Uh, but my next match was actually versus Noah Bouse. And I've wrestled him up to that point. I wrestled him twice before that. Lost both times. Uh, good wrestler from Okaboji. It was his senior year, actually, I believe it was. And he's qualified for state up until that point. It was his third time. Um, but I vividly really remember, you know, going to the center of the mat before the match started and he's kind of, you know, he's babying the arm a little bit, his shoulder. So, you know, I was like, all right, here's my chance. You know, I'm, if he's going to show me something that I can take advantage of, I'm absolutely going to take advantage of it. So I remember that match was like, for me, it was very big on, um, I guess it, it helped me propel me into that next match versus Bodie Garnier from Sumner, but it gave me that confidence. I needed that. I really did. So, you know, I handled uh, Noah pretty well, like 13-5 or something like that. And uh, I was very ecstatic to be in a position to possibly place, you know. And I didn't I didn't really expect that of myself going in, which might be kind of bad. You know, I probably should have, but I didn't really know what to expect. My first time there and uh, yeah. the, the crowd was just, oh, man, it was – the atmosphere was nuts. But, um, yeah, I won in overtime versus Bodie. Uh, with a late single leg takedown and yeah oh man that was uh that was a lot of fun I I'll, I'll never forget that moment so 
How do you, but yeah. How do you prepare to wrestle in front of an entire arena of people? Do you just have to try your best to zone it out or do you use that to your advantage that? I mean, how do you how do you handle that um, first timer? That's a good question. Yeah. I think I think at first, like when you uh you get on the mat for your very first match, I think like right before the match starts, you're like you're you're a little bit in awe, you're starstruck in a sense. Like this is one of the biggest state tournaments in the whole United States, uh realistically. Um but as soon as that whistle blows, it was it was almost like you were in, you know, in the Brit high school at Al De Leon tournament. You know what I mean? You you just zone in and um you, you just business. do what you need to do. So yeah. Uh, and what uh so that was your junior year. Um senior year didn't make it back. What happened in twenty seventeen? Or yeah, yeah. That was uh you know, I was having a pretty solid year too, up until, you know, I, I remember, you know, there was points in the year where um, my attitude kind of stunk and it wasn't what it should have been as, as a leader of the team. Like I remember uh, we wrestled Lake Mills in a duel at Lake Mills before uh, Christmas break. So uh, I wrestled Gabe Irons, who was at 182 uh, previously the year before I wrestled him at 170, beat him 11, 0, 10, 0. And he ended up beating me three nothing. So I was like, oh man, I was just, uh, I was very discouraged after that. And, you know, I, I did what, you know, I did, I went to, you know, social media after that. And this was after I committed to Dort. And I'm like, oh man, can't wait for football. Just a stupid thing to do. You know what I mean? But as a, as a young kid, just not something a leader should do. But I remember Coach Mark took me, <laughs> took me into Coach Bob's office in the gym and he let me have it and rightfully so like because I needed that and that kind of gave me that um confidence I needed to lock lock back in essentially and finish out the year as strong as I could but yeah kind of fast forwarding to um sectionals districts I wrestled uh I lost to Jarrell Arbogast from West Fork who actually ended up in the finals that year I lost to him at sectionals uh came in as a two seat at districts one, uh, no, I, I wrestled my first match. Yeah, that was the one I lost. I wrestled my first match versus Dakota Vance of Rockford. And he was a good guy. I've talked to him, you know, after the fact. And he's actually a pretty dang good MMA fighter now. Um, he's a good kid. But, yeah, went in eight to five, 30 seconds left, and got thrown. I and the next thing I know, you know, I'm on my back looking up at the lights and a headlock, and that was that. So that was a very, very tough pill to swallow because I <laughs> – I don't know. You know, I, I should have had a better showing than that. And I know. And I, I knew at that point, like I knew I probably wouldn't get a wrestle back. Cause I think Jarrell, you know, he obviously handled Dakota pretty well. Um, but yeah, I knew I wouldn't get a wrestle back and that was a was very tough pill to swallow that year. Um, and then especially going down to the state tournament, you know, a week later and seeing that Dakota Vance, he placed eighth out of injury default too. Like he could have got better as well but he had injury default his last match or something, but and then Jarrell. Yeah. Jarrell uh, pins the returning state champ Tanner Sloan from Albernet, um, which I was very happy for him. He's a, he's a really good guy. He, he deserved that. So, but I, I watched those guys and I was like, man, you know, I, what, what could have been kind of thing. Like, I think I would have had a pretty decent run at the tournament and placed, you know, somewhat high, but you know, that's just the what if game and you really couldn't do anything about it, but. Yeah, that was uh, one of those moments in life where it was like, man, that's the low of the lows. So, Yeah, but on the flip side, I mentioned that you're one of 260 state qualifiers. So you, you're on that list with the Bob Steenledges and the Jeff and Mark Stevensons and the, the, you know, Tate Hagens and the Mark, you know, you're on that list with all those guys that have made it to state and then an even smaller list of guys who have placed. So, yeah, you know, you, you get that. You know, again, we were kind of spoiled at West Hancock. Like, oh, I only made it to state once, or oh, we didn't make it oh. to the team this year, but we, we were one game away. It's like, man, some how many people would just kill to be in the position that some of us and you guys as athletes have been? So, oh, I, yeah, I, you know, I was you know quite what? the advocate on the positive side, too. So, exactly. Yeah. And you know what? The sun ended up coming up the next day. I thought the world ended for a second there, but uh, <laughs> the sun came up, man. And you know, it was, uh, I think it was, it's moments like that, you know, in your life where, you know, you're kind of at the bottom and you're, you're in this dark place. And you're like, man, it can't get any worse than this, but like, you know, you really can't appreciate like the, the good moments in life and until you kind of, you know, you have a couple of those hiccups and, yeah. you know, that was just one of mine, but yeah, I was 
you know, very lucky to have even went in the first place to state. Yeah. So, and then yeah. you just talked about coach Sanger gave you a little butt chewing for this and that. And, you know, Bob oh, yeah. he did that as well. Um, I bet you when you went to school that next day or that next week, the Miss T's of the world were there to, to help you out and there to talk you through it. And Holly Lang and all those teachers, you know, just talk about some of the teachers and other coaches you had that helped, you know, help you learn those life lessons and get through the hard things. Yeah. Speaking of Miss T, actually, I was, uh, this is something I definitely wanted to touch on. So junior year after I placed at the tournament um, in that specific match uh, where I got on the podium versus Sumner uh, fella, uh, I came to school Monday and Miss T came up to me and she was like, I just want to, I want to let you know something. I was listening on the radio to your match when you end up winning in overtime and I, I, I couldn't help but cry. And I was like, that really, that, that hit me pretty dang hard. I remember going home after school that day and I, I shed some tears cause I'm like, you know, you don't think you have that big of an impact, um, especially on people like Miss T who has impacted hundreds of students. You know what I mean? If you, if you ask a lot of people who went to West Hancock, Hey, who's your favorite teacher? Her name probably going to come up 80% of the time, you know? So, um, that, I don't know. Yeah. Miss T, she, uh, she was awesome for that. I needed to hear that too. It was a, it was a really cool feeling um, to have someone like her say that. And um, I loved her class as well. Like on the education side of things, she had a great class and I really enjoyed, uh, you know, um, what she taught, you know, creative writing and things like that, you know, reading poems, reading books. And uh, she made class fun. She made it interesting as well as Miss Lang. Uh, it's the second teacher I really wanted to shout out. Um, love being in Miss Lang's class. She's one of the best teachers. She is, uh, she has a way of connecting with kids and she keeps things light. She keeps them happy and, uh, she keeps things interesting. Like you, you're not going to doze off in her class kind of thing, you know? So, um, yeah, they're very it's, instrumental. I was just up in Brit last month on spring break. I was doing some stuff for my sports stuff I do and I pop into Miss T's room and she you know she always has time for her former students you know if you're at the dome um people are it always seems like there's a line of former students going to pay homage to Mrs. Miss T um but the funny thing is when what's her tunnel vision is her current students getting yeah. them better writers and better people that's her focus I walk in oh Mr. Carl good to see you you know and I say hey T how you doing we're talking you know I have a quick conversation she goes hey him and I have to work on our paper right now. So I'll talk to you later. Okay. And so I'm like, all right, see you T, you know, it's just like <laughs> what's in front of her, those current kids, that is her, that's her focus. That's her drive. She has not lost any steam in terms of, you know, the drive to make these kids better and to help them be better writers and better readers and everything. Um, that just, it just cracked me up. I, so I went into Miss Lang's room because Holly and I have been friends for 20 some years. She was never my teacher, but I've known her most of my life. I said, T pretty much just kicked me out. She was, oh, she helping a kid do a paper or something I'm like, yep. <laughs> it's just, she's heard it a hundred times probably, you know, yep, I mean? <laughs> like that's who she needs to focus on. I love that. You know, I, I wasn't offended obviously because her and I are pretty close too. And I just know she has this amount of minutes per class to work with these kids. That's what she needs to focus on. I love that about her. So she has an amazing way of connecting to every single student in her class and making every single student feel involved. Like, I think that's a very rare trait as a teacher. Um, she did a wonderful job of that. And, you know, yeah, like you said, she, yeah, you never felt, you never felt like, uh, I don't know what even word to use, but you never felt like, discouraged in her class or like you couldn't figure something out she was there to help you she'd get around to you so she's 100 yeah. percent. and you know the book i wrote about football and wrestling i asked her to be my editor and i had it in my mind and i shouldn't have because i was dumb of me that miss t wasn't going to give 100 percent to something I'm like she'll she'll get through it and she'll just check for major errors and flow and stuff that lady spent hundreds no exaggeration hundreds of hours helping me get that book done and I am forever grateful. Um, she made that book so much better than I could have ever made it. And then I wanted to put her name on the cover. And she threw a fit and said, absolutely not. My name is not going on there at all. I put <laughs> her in the, like, the thank you page. And she was even like, no. And I'm like, you don't get a choice in this matter. Usually you're the one telling us what to do or not to do. I said, you deserve it. Like 100% deserve it. She went 
20 times above and beyond probably what I would have done for somebody else for free. You know, <laughs> she just, yeah. she's like, no, I'm a, she, had, she loved, she kept saying though, I, my years, you know, from the the eighties to now her 30 some years, she goes, I got to the part with my kids. She just kept calling, you know, your era, my era, her kids. Oh, and you'd start writing about the Jordan Wylands and the John Mallons and the whoever else. Those were, you know, she just, she just dug in and she's like, I read that and I read it again. She just, she's phenomenal. So I can never. That uh, does not surprise me. She did not want any recognition at all. That's just exactly no. who she is. And I think that speaks volumes to her character as an individual, like, she just wants to help, you know what I mean? And she doesn't care if she gets the praise for it or not, you know, and yep. that's a, a very rare thing as well. Like, people are naturally selfish. They're naturally, they want the, they want the limelight kind of thing, you know, and not her, not her. She just wants to help. Yeah. Like, that's amazing. She's, a, she's an amazing person. This fall at the uh, alumni banquet, we're going to honor her and Linda Sanger. Who talk, about, talk about two people that exemplify that completely as that selfless, um, don't want the spotlight don't want the credit we just that's just what we do so we're going to honor those two as our educators of the year and then linda sangers go on also into the athletic hall of fame and i i'm the one who writes up the bios and stuff and the stuff you say at those and i struggle i'm like this should be the easiest one to write but it's also the hardest one to write because i'm like she's done every like I, I can't even begin to write a list of all the things she's done for our school so i had kevin sanger sit down with her and they made a list of things but even Linda was like, I don't know about other things. I don't, you know, it was just like, she's done so much. She can't even remember what she's done. And you can't go to the old newspaper archives and find a lot of it because so much of it was just behind the scenes stuff. So, oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'm sure she purposely left some stuff out too, you know, like <laughs> she's done a million different things for our community and our school and our athletic programs, the cheerleading programs. Like she was instrumental when I was in high school, like to, for cheerleaders, you know, and we didn't that like when I was in high school, I don't think we had like a crazy amount of cheerleaders or anything like that, but like, you know, that was her focus and she just did an amazing job of, um, you know, making sure they had what they needed. And um, yeah, she was uh, instrumental. Absolutely. In every, every aspect, aspect of the word. So. Those are just two of many. I mean, we had so many people oh, in our communities that are always doing something, always helping, always giving, always donating, all, you know, just all the things. So pretty blessed to grow up where we did. So, Oh, yeah. Very yeah. blessed. I think this is a good, uh, good place to wrap it up here. Uh, thanks again to all my sponsors you see on the screen. Um, kind of tying in with what we were just talking about. These are small businesses they give back to the community like crazy. So, and including this podcast. So if you get a chance, make sure you patronize these, uh, these businesses, use these local businesses as much as you can, because Brit's a pretty awesome town in Kanawha when it comes to uh, the businesses that you get, that they have there. It's not like that everywhere. So next on the podcast, I have Jeff Stevenson. He'll be a 2024 hall of famer, uh, the 1973 undefeated Kanawha football team, Shea Smith, current cheerleader at UNI. Uh, we mentioned him earlier, Matthew Francis, along with Paul Francis, Coach Francis, and then Jared Hexen will be my next five podcasts. Jordan, it's been a pleasure. Any uh, any other shout outs or things you want to get out there uh, before we wrap it up? Oh, I mean, you know, it, that's the I mean, I'm sure people have said it before, but like I I could have went for hours just, you know, just reminiscing and talking about people who have played a huge role in my success, but not only my success, like, you know, people I went to school with and, you know, uh, a lot of people who are in that record book, like there's hundreds of people that, you know, in the community that, that deserve some praise and recognition. And I could have went for way too long, you know what I mean? So that, that's, uh, that really shows, um, you know, who, do, who who we have around us and how lucky we were. So, no, the pleasure was mine, Dan. I, it's been an honor to be on here. I'm glad you're doing something like this, and I thank you for uh, including me in it. You bet, man. It was a good time. Like I always end it with, go Eagles. Go Eagles. You bet. Take care. <laughs>